afternoon, everybody. Today is October 20th, October 16th, 2020, and we're back with Fridays in Feldman, and hopefully with some improved technology uh, so you can hear me. I've also taken into consideration today some questions people have asked me to do, which is to look at some data uh, that we are presenting and we are actually publishing in the near future about some of the more revolutionary or changes that we've made in treatment. So today's topic is a little bit unusual, which is uh, multiple hereditary asbestosis or MHG in adults, and I'll go through that, and I'll look at some data for MHG in general that we have changed and some altered treatments. So MHG in, adult, in adults is a pretty ignored subject, but basically we're going to talk about a little bit about the hip, the spine, the lower extremity, limb like differences that occur in MHG, uh, the knee, the ankle, the shoulder, arm, the forearm, and what about tumor load and the risk of cancer and things like that. Uh, in MHG. I think that since most people don't pay too much attention to adults and they're often ignored, they only care about our children with this condition, I'm going to really only talk about adults until I get to some of the data. So there are a few studies done, and it is definitely treatable. What do I mean by treatable? Chronic pain is not inevitable if you're an adult with MHG. And basically, it is preferable to treat before arthritis develops so we can prevent arthritis. Now, arthritis occurs for many reasons. It can occur because you have overdone it, you've been a real big athlete, and you've ruined your knees, or because you have myeloid or something like that, like an MHG, or maybe you have a tumor near the joint, which is causing a problem. And nerve pain can also be relieved by decompressing nerves, and this as well can be relieved. I'm going to go through some cases uh, to show you. So this is a, uh, a woman in her uh, mid-60s who came to see me, or she's low 60s, and she had not really been treated with MHG. And you can see, or maybe you can, that she has tumors, around the hip, and I'm showing this some right. There's also arthritis in the joint. And we salvaged the joint for a while, but she'd never been treated. So there's a lot of malalignments. This angle, which is 180 degrees, should really be about 135 degrees. And it put a lot of force for many years on these hips, and she was suffering. But this is already late. This is late to start treating this condition. And we could have treated her early, and I'll show you. So this woman had some surgery done, and then eventually had arthritis and hip replacements. But even hip replacements removes your pain and she can go on with her activities. So my partner in the mind performs these uh, surgeries on total joints. I don't perform total joint replacements. But this is well in, in, in an older adult who can't be salvaged, who has arthritis already, could have total hip replacements and regain their function. And the tumors can be all be removed around there. Now some of the other tumors, for instance, this one of the pelvis can become painful. And that too could be removed even as an adult. And this is a similar uh, patient. He's in his uh, mid or uh, late 40s, mid to late 40s. But again, not really treated correctly. The joint is uncovered. The joint is arthritic. And again, he eventually will need hip replacements in his late 40s. But the real question is, how do you prevent that? So here's a young adult who has a big tumor load. And you can see these very large tumors on her pelvis and actually on her femurs and around the hip. And the hip is now aligned and dislocated. And that can be salvaged without doing hip replacements by removing the tumors and actually putting the ball back in the socket after it's been removed. And this is called the varus osteotomy. It was done on both hips with the removal of all those large osteochondromas that you saw on that CAT scan. And she did very well, got her motion back, got her function back, and really got her life back because it hurt her all the time. And on the spine, similarly, you can have small tumors that cause pain or large tumors that don't. And the spine can be treated at any age, adult or children, for removal of these tumors. And you can see this tumor on the MRI really sticking out of the neck of that patient, and that was removed. So that's how the hip can be treated and salvaged in an adult. What about limb length? Sometimes patients in, in, with, with MHG, one leg grows longer than another. Now that happens during childhood, but it's suffering during adulthood because it causes over an inch, and you get back pain, you have other hip pain. So there was a woman in her late 40s who with, with already had a partial knee replacement, who basically had about a three and a half centimeter, or somewhere around an inch and a half difference between her two legs. And she didn't want to live like that. It was causing back pain and hip pain and other problems. And so even in an adult, this can be lengthened. And the way we do that is we place a rod in the bone that you can see over here. And she was able to walk on this up, this um, after surgery. And that rod actually lengthens. You put a magnet on your, on your leg. And this is called a stride now. And basically this now allows the patient to walk and lengthen close to an inch and a half or a full inch and a half 
And then it heals up, and you can remove the rod, which was done later. But you can see the bone fills in after it's lengthened. There's no device on the outside of the leg. And we're able to lengthen the bone and give this woman equal limb weights and take away a lot of her back discomfort and other pains. So that's what happens when you have a limb length discrepancy as an adult. This is quite easily treatable um, at that time. I'm showing this case because this is a young woman, uh, middle of college, who basically said, so many things are bothering me, I just feel hopeless. And so how do we sort of approach that if that's your body? If you have so many areas that are bothering you, and everybody just thinks you're complaining, which you're not, in my opinion, I think that each one could be divided separately. So I will show you what I think. This woman, this young woman, has a large osteocardial behind her knee. That was hitting the sciatic nerve, causing her severe nerve pain, which she was taking medication for. Pain medication for her hip, which I'll show you in a minute. Her arms were a problem. Her shoulder blades were a problem. And we just divided it up. And she actually spent three months in West Palm Beach. And we sequentially took care of all the problems. So one of her bigger problems, I don't know why you see it, and I'll show you on the next slide, is a big tumor sitting off of her hip. And this could be named Vesuvius or whatever mountain you like. But that is really incompatible without having pain sticking up in the front of your hip joint. And so that had to be removed to make her less painful. And this was also quite painful on the inside there. And that's the same hip. So we dislocated that hip and took out those tumors. And you can see the tumors on the MRI. And there it is. And basically this is after removal. And some of these screws are removed, just are placed just to protect the bone um, and how it heals um, after removing these large tumors. Well now her pain her hip went away, but she still had that pain behind her knee, which I showed you before. So this was removed. Be careful of the nerve and artery, you, you release the nerve and artery. You decompress it, it's called. And basically, that allows the pain to go away. And these large tumors behind the knee often cause nerve pain and often cause pain in muscles and can be removed. And that was what was done for this woman. And there it is on the CAT scan. And there it is after removal. So now that pain is gone. Sometimes there's pain between the ankle, in the ankle joint, either because of malalignment, and I'll talk about that at the end when we talk about data, or just because there's a tumor there. And that can be removed as well. And it was. So then she had good alignment, she had no more pain in her legs, and then it went to the upper extremities. So tumors about the shoulder blade. That is really a problem because many times if you see this one, I'll try to bring this around, this is almost like a pick on a guitar hitting the ribs as you move your arm up and down. And you can really see it sticking out from behind the shoulder blade. And the ribs almost play like a, like a strumming of the, of the strings on a guitar, and it's quite painful as it goes up and down. And that is really not difficult to remove, and also it removes the pain, leaves the pain in the shoulder blade that adults with MHG have. And there it is again, you see it right there coming out, almost like a pick on a guitar, that's what I call it. So she had that removed as well. And that's just removed. Okay, wrists. Now her wrist also, she previously had surgery on her wrist and had a big plate in there. But if you see, and this is pre op and this is post op, what's happening is if you have a very high angle at your wrist of this bone called the radius, that's called radial inclination, the whole wrist slips off to the side and you don't have grip strength. And so all that's required is I removed the plate that she previously had someone else put in to straighten the bone, which is okay. But that's the big problem. She had no grip strength. And so all you do is basically tilt up this bone, let it heal, and that allows the grip strength to return. And she returned home on no pain medication, no nerve pain medication, and basically went back to life even after it had all been hopeless. So just to show you, and that's in an adult. What about alignment? So when you are knock-kneed or, or bow-legged with MHE, or even without MHE, that often can cause you to develop arthritis in, because it's directing forces to the outside of the knee if you're knock knee, to the inside of your knee if you're bow legged. Well, this woman is knock knee, she's in her low, uh, low 50s, young 50s, and all, I basically straightened out the bone. And I didn't use a fixator, I put a plate on there and did that. And that basically made her bone straight and her leg straight. She also had a tumor in the hip, which is inside the bone, which can happen in MHA. And basically did both of those and straightened her leg. So now it's completely straight. But her ankle 
is also tilted. This should be 90 degrees to the floor. If your ankle is tilted, you're going to get arthritis. You're going to have pain. So I untilted her ankle. And I'll show you that at the end when I discuss data. And then we have patients with a really significant tumor load. So some of you out there with MHT have very few tumors, and they can be bothersome. And some have just so many tumors, you don't even know where to start. Well, you start where they hurt, but mostly around your hips in this area where they hurt. And so again, you can take out all of the tumors from around the hip. He had both of these done. He had knock knees like that past one, but it was in his tibia, leg bone, not his femur bone. And so I straightened the bone. He also had a tumor in his spine that you can just watch. So again, you take, you, you, you figure out the, the tumor load, you figure out which tumors are really causing trouble, and then you treat those tumors. And so there he had his hip done, and then he had his leg straightened with a frame because it was too much to do acutely, meaning that you can't do that just by pushing the bone. And we slowly corrected it, and he has a straight leg and no more tumors in the hip. And he's much better off now than he was before. And recently, he had these removed. Okay, let's say a few words about the concern for cancer, and then we'll talk about some data after that. Malignant tumors is very rare in MHA, probably certainly less than 5%, probably less than 1% of patients who have MHA will develop cancer. And even if one of those tumors is cancerous, it is very low grade cancer, meaning that it does not metastasize, it does not usually become cancer, it does not usually lead to death or real severe problems. But certainly, it's something that has to be watched in adulthood, and adults should be seen if a tumor is growing. A lot of tumors around the pelvis can become cancerous, around the shoulder blades they can become cancerous, and those are the ones that often do become, can become cancerous, but not often again, and now almost never high grade. In fact, if you look in the literature, which I did, there's only one patient I can found from South Africa who's been reported to have died from a cancer from MHE, and that was ignored for many years on uh, that tumor. If I see a very large tumor in an adult that's been growing, I would get worried that this is a cancer and should be removed, certainly should be removed in adulthood. And all of you should be followed who have MHE, certainly every couple of years, just to see what's going on, to have a conversation with the, uh, your physician or your surgeon to discuss uh, the different tumors that are either growing, bothering you, or what's going on. Okay, let's switch subjects. For those of you who don't like data, turn off your computers right now. And for those of you who do like data, and uh, you've asked me for, I will give it to you. So, one big change in treatment, adult and children, that we've done in MHE is the forearm and the elbow. Elbows dislocate in MHE in, in childhood, and often we can leave people with very short forearms that don't function quite as well. People live lives with it, but it doesn't function as well as it could. And therefore, we've changed the treatment. This is an old classification that's mostly used. For me, it doesn't make much sense. But this is a massage classification, which looks at what type of forearm you have. Here you have a bend with, with, with the osteochondroma near your wrist. Here you have one dislocated near your wrist and elbow. Near your wrist and elbow. Here it's dislocated just near your wrist. It doesn't make sense to me. And here it's located, not bent, but just near your near your wrist. So I'm not sure I understand this classification to help me treat it. So we changed that and changed the treatment. So we, did, we, we looked at 73 forearms and 43 patients that we treated differently. And we looked at what causes you, what causes an MHG patient to dislocate their radial head? What causes you to basically um, have a dislocation of the elbow, which we know shortens the elbow, causing cosmetic problems and functional problems? And you can see, so what we found basically is that a bowing of the, of the ulna causes a dislocation of the radial head. So if you don't have bowing of it, it will dislocate. The shorter the ulna, the shorter this small bone is, the less bowing you need to dislocate. So it makes it worse. But you don't need the length of that bone. It doesn't have to be lengthened. It just has to be straightened. So we've been now straightening these bones, and we did methodology with, you know, with logistic regression to find that basically, I'll get to this slide, that basically your total ulnar bone, that bowing of the ulnar bone, causes your radial head dislocation. And the shorter your ulnar is, the less bowing you need to dislocate it. And that is basically the data, which is a very statistically significant finding why elbows dislocate. That's why they've never been found before. So in using that for treatment, we created a, a basic, myself and Dr. Taylor, my partner, created a classification for these forearms. 
So the type of normal would be a both straight, type one would be just an osteochondroma. But then you start getting into when it starts bowing and then it starts dislocating. And that's when we get okay, 2B is when I can prevent this from coming out of the joint and becoming a 2C. And whether or not it has you know, that wrist problem that we talked about before, or it doesn't have that wrist problem that we talked about before. So well, that's just different. That doesn't cause the elbow to dislocate. And so I, did, so I started doing very minimally invasive procedures on you know, your children and adolescents just to keep their real head located. And we've been able to do that by just straightening the ulna through very small incisions with really good results and no elbows dislocated since I started doing this operation in preventing dislocation. We went from the data of knowing why they dislocate to creating an operation that then prevents dislocation. So we've stopped lengthening ulnas, or I've stopped lengthening ulnas, and I've just straightened them through minimally invasive surgery, which has prevented dislocation. So I don't want anybody with MHG being born or growing up now to dislocate again. Here's when we were straightening and lengthening, but we don't have to do that. And then this is when you fix that wrist that I told you about when the wrist is slipping. So that's basically the forearm. This is if someone already had a dislocated elbow, where you try to put it back in, which we did, by lengthening it out. But that's, we try to prevent this from happening. Yes, you can treat this in type 2C, but you don't want this to happen. So, as I've said, radial ulna bone, that bowing of that ulna bone in your forearm causes your radius to pop out. Shorter the bone, more easily pops out. And basically, um, this can be prevented. Okay, what about ankles? So, let's talk about ankles for a few minutes. Um, I think there's no question that in adults, ankle morbidity, meaning that pain, and arthritis is a big problem. How do you prevent that? So that was our next, with 109 ankles, and 61 consecutive patients that we treated, and we looked for where the osteochondroma was, and whether or not the ankle was disrupted. And so basically, this is the a classification that we created for the ankles, to basically say that your ankle can be disrupted, the joint can be completely disrupted in two and threes, and they can be treated. And how do we treat that? And that was actually, um, this is taken from uh, my partner's treatment of, of congenitals, where we can actually, if you just have tilting like that woman had, well, then I can basically just straighten it, right? I can just straighten the joint out without doing anything else. If you're very young, maybe I can just put a growth plate device in there and have you grow it out. But in an adult, we can straighten it, and in someone who's young, we can hopefully get them to modify their growth and let them grow out. But if the joint is disrupted, and you can see it's disrupted here, then you can shorten the tibia bone, called it an S-H-O-R-D-T operation, a short operation, to allow, and here's before and here's after, to allow the tibia to be the right length and restore the ankle, to restore the ankle. And then the last type is when you have this V-shaped, and it's also disrupted, and then we actually make an opening of the joint itself, like this. And so basically, we are able to restore the ankle joint so that when you reach adulthood, or if you're an adult with a tilted ankle, we can actually fix the ankle by doing this. And so in the data, we were able to see what all of these patients had, whether well, 62 had normal ankles, 29 had type 1s, 15 had type 2s, and rarely have a type 3, which is usually caused by treatment. And we talked about what everybody underwent to correct this and the results that we got in correcting these patients. So the pain and deformity resolved in all patients. In some patients, it recurred if they still had a lot of growth left after they had a short. So we've, we've revised that. And we do place a wire sometimes in the, in the fibula, the outside bone, to prevent fracture. So these are the ways that we've designed that we've followed up and done our data. We've now uh, submitted these for publication and they'll be submitted. So we have a new classification for the ankles and an operation that was utilized for congenitals that we've now adopted to an operation for multiple hereditary osteosis. So um, you can read this, you can look at the data, but that is the data for today. Um, I will be following, since people are asking for data, the next topic will be um, my data on orthogryposis, uh, flexion, the formulas of knees that were, put, that were actually submitted for publication. And the one after that, we will talk about the data for using periacetabular osteotomies for hip dysplasia. Um, so those are, I think I answered the questions that were asked to me beforehand regarding MHG, but if there's any questions you have now, 
certainly I can answer them. Otherwise, you can email us um, through Facebook, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, regarding MHG or any topics that we discussed. I know I ran through that, but, uh, but basically that is um, MHG as an adult in a nutshell, and I think that the take-home message is it's not hopeless, that there's plenty of treatment possibilities. Um, so wishing everybody a great weekend in the middle of October, um, and wishing you all well, and uh, have a great weekend um, in this, and then enjoy the fall weather. Um, we'll see you soon. <laughs> well, I guess it's my fifth anniversary here, so uh, they got me a gift. Okay, so I've been five years down at Paley Institute, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> all right, guys, thanks.